crowdy here, so just feel yourself more comfortable. Get in and keep some space for early uh, late birds. Okay, so and uh, today we will be talking about uh, how to create efficient search, full text search, and how to use it to uh, to make uh, to make your website fancy with the uh, MySQL and Sphinx. And uh, today we'll be talking together about it. I'm from uh, performance side and from the side of uh, operations because uh, I enjoy the operations. I did it for a long time, especially with Sphinx. And uh, to give you more uh, details about advanced uh, features that Sphinx have, we have Andrew, who actually created, created invented Sphinx and uh, developed it for like many, many years. He's hiding uh, right here, but uh, he will get, get up uh, a little bit later. Okay. Yeah, he will wake up eventually. Somewhere in the middle of the second part or something like that. Okay, so let's just get started. So um, we have uh, Blackbird have a booth next to the Google, and uh, which is noticed that that company somehow really popular. Uh, we don't know why, uh, but we expect that that's because of fancy search uh, engine uh, they have. So uh, r right now, people get used to have that fancy, uh, fancy search, fast, reliable, uh, relevant. So that, uh, we're trying to do the same thing uh, with the local websites with uh, using Sphinx. And why do we use it? Uh, well, apparently, Apparently, most databases already have what they call integrated uh, full text search, uh, MySQL. To, uh, nowadays, MyISM uh, and IDDB both has full text search, which is very convenient. It works out of the box. Uh, but apparently, uh, at some point, it's going, uh, going to perform very, very slow. And it's uh, really not convenient to search uh, against, like, say, tens of gigabytes data or, or full text uh, data inside of MySQL. So well, you have I, to. I'd argue that it's convenient, all right, right? You just fire a query with a newer database, and then two weeks later, you get a result. So it's convenient, just not too fast. <laughs> yeah, so somehow people are trying to. Uh, Get search results a little bit earlier than one, one you know, than in one week, so they develop somehow extended uh, ex external search uh, engines, and we have few. Uh, right now, we have Sphinx. We have several uh, search engines based on uh, Lucene library, which use Java, uh, and there is uh, several hosted ser uh, services that uh, you can find on the internet uh, just to put your data without worrying about underlying infrastructure, which is very convenient. And uh, most of them based uh, on the uh, Lucene and Sphinx. So why not use MySQL? Why not use Solar? Well, you can do whatever you like. But Sphinx is uh, quite fast. It's uh, highly integratable with MySQL. And he, he talks pretty, pretty much the same language as MySQL do. And it's, uh, it's really, really fast. Uh, Procona, at some point, had a benchmarks. Uh, MyISM against IDDB, against uh, uh, Lucene, and Solar, and uh, Sphinx. And uh, somehow, Sphinx won the competition with uh, both uh, performance and indexing speed. So, and just just another uh, another search server will not hurt anyone. So Sphinx is not uh, what what Sphinx is not. It's not a plugin to MySQL. It's like some people. Who, by the way, who uses Sphinx already? Uh, who uses MySQL? Okay, yeah. So basically, if you if you use MySQL and you won't just take uh, take your Full text search performance on the next level. You just need to install Sphinx because it's, but it's not, it's not a plugin. You can run it separately. You can run run it without MySQL. You can run it with the every database engine you like. And uh, 
it doesn't require MySQL at all. And like I said, it's, uh, to connect, you may want to use library, but we will talk uh, later about it. So it's not, a, it's not a replacement. It's just addition to uh, like a very specific addition for specific services. Why Sphinx? It's really, really fast, like I said, and it's very scalable. It supports uh, high availability. It supports uh, fast index indexing. It's just uh, it supports real time indexing, if you like. Whatever whatever you want to do with uh, with a MySQL on the full text search side can be done with Sphinx. So just. If we talk about numbers and uh, what Andrew said about weeks uh, to get the results is, is not very far from, uh, from actual numbers, uh, when you have really big installations of data, like uh, uh, tens or hundreds of gigabytes, it takes a huge time for MySQL to, uh, to work, uh, to get the results set back. As we move from the MySQL to the Sphinx, we get some uh, we get uh, we get performance boost like 100 times. And well, why? It's it's not because MySQL is bad. It's because MySQL is designed to store specific data in a specific way, reliable, convenient way. That's uh, that's basically it. And if you know Craigslist. Sphinx, uh, Sphinx is, is inside it, helping you search in, uh, to search queries. Let's talk about how to uh, how to install it, how to prepare for uh, for having search like like Google does. Well, not exactly because it's it's about a little, a little bit different, but still, still same uh, that fancy as a Google app. You can go to the you can get binary packages from the Sphinx website. You can uh, build your own Sphinx if you like from source code. You can change it; it's open source. If you don't like something uh, in Sphinx, you can change it uh, the way you like. Theoretically. Well, especially documentation. So it is not that uh, hard to to install. It's like. If, if you if you have Linux box, you can just uh, download and install it. And the only uh, the only thing is just to configure it properly, just to tell Sphinx where where to get the data, where how to process it, and where to store uh, store actual indexes. And it's, uh, you have a variety of options. You can get uh, data from the MySQL. Uh, you can get data from uh, MSSQL, Postgres, XML pipe. Uh, Oracle should be in that list. We missed that in slides. Uh, and C CSV pipe as well. So to query data source, uh, to, to, cre to configure data source, you just need pretty much like, like this. You need to supply query, which will go to the MySQL and grab all the data you want. Uh, to be uh, all the data you want to be searchable, and you can uh, set up attributes besides uh, full text data uh, to dist distinguish full text data that uh, you want to have in Sphinx and non full text like uh, author ID, category ID, something else. Uh, the one thing that you must have there is uh, document ID, it should be positive integer. And it should be unique. That's basically all the obligations you have uh, you have to uh, run uh, you have when, when you run in Sphinx. Well, complete version is uh, is for really busy, really big data sets. So you can ask Sphinx to uh, not not to pull uh, to get all the data in one uh, query, which is sometimes not convenient when you have 150 gigabytes of data in one table. But uh, you can ask Sphinx to get uh, portion by portion, like uh, in a split document set in batches, uh, like one one thousand or so, and just uh, Sphinx will do it for you. It will throttle down uh, a load on the MySQL. It will be it, it will keep MySQL happy. Well, uh, now you need to provide some. Uh, I, 
give a Sphinx idea or on when, where, where, how, to, how to process it. You can, uh, you can supply morphology. Sphinx uh, do it out of the box. Uh, you can create a stop word list uh, with a list that uh, of words that you don't want to search, like uh, high frequency words like uh, the, I, or just adult words that you don't want to have in your index at all times, just to keep it safe for um, uh, children search. So, and that's basically basically. And you you need to provide a path where uh, where Sphinx will store uh, Sphinx indexes. Uh, Actual, uh, actual on disk indexes, and the index server configuration is really, really easy, like that. On the uh, busy instances, you might want to tune up max IOPS and max IOSIs uh, just to throttle down uh, how throttle down IO cons consumption during the index uh, indexing. And that's basically how it works. You just run an indexer, and it goes to the, to the MySQL or to any database or just to some kind of file, uh, writing scripts or whatever. You get it somehow, you get in data. It is quite fast. If you take a look, it's like uh, one million do documents, less than uh, less in uh, three minutes. And it's like one core. You can parallel it. Any comments? I recently found out that this is slow. So yeah. we're, we're improving it approximately two or three fold in the coming versions. Yeah, so this, the, that would be nice. So in the next uh, Sphinx version, you probably will see a little increased. Yeah, we're targeting 15, maybe 20 megabytes a second. On per core? Yes, per core. Well, meaning like up to 80 or 100 megs a second or modest for every box. So once we have done this uh, setup, let's just take a look on how, how this stuff works. So basically you have Sphinx Daemon. It goes to the uh, index, in indexer creating, uh, creating solid index out of the database. It's it using by Sphinx Daemon. And application querying, uh, querying Sphinx for full text search results and uh, faceted for faceted search and other services that we will mention later. And uh, that's basically it. Application can request, uh, could request some more data from, from MySQL or another store or from uh, cache to, to speed up it. But, uh, but generally, it's, it, it's easy like that. So, what I need to do to, to make it work, we need to run a run daemon, connect to it, and just send the send the query and read, read the results. To configure it, to configure things, we just need to supply ports that uh, it needs to be to listen on, and uh, supply well query log file if you're interested uh, in uh, details how things is uh, performing. So uh, you can connect using Sphinx API which is for various uh, variety of uh, languages without any, if, if you like uh, the API style. But at some point, Sphinx is supporting uh, Sphinx SphinxQL, which is MySQL compat compatible protocol. You need MySQL library. So you basically can connect to, to Sphinx like, uh, like you connect to the MySQL. It will be different port, but uh, the same, uh, pretty much the same language. Select from where? And uh, it's not a big deal to rewrite the query that you already have with MySQL. So uh, that's how, how it looks uh, from the, from the uh, command line side. You just, you just uh, fire up MySQL client, and it connects to the Sphinx. Just notice the server version is not MySQL. It's a Sphinx one. And uh, the difference is it's real data. It's not, it's not made up. It's, um, so, uh, full text search on the MySQL site and on the Sphinx site, so you can see the difference. It's I think it's eight million, uh, yeah, it's like eight million rows. So it's not it's not that big data. It's just like tiny uh, tiny amount of the articles that uh, needs to be searched, uh, and it's already already that huge performance uh, difference. But that's that's why I love Sphinx. So what Sphinx scale is? It's basically a, a somehow re-implementation of MySQL protocol with its own uh, additions, like uh, 
you can you can use uh, where you can use match uh, instead of uh, match against. You can use uh, group, different group by syntaxes. Uh, you can tune up the limits, a variety of limits. You can supply uh, search options inside the inside the query. How to uh, d tell how the things will be treating different indexes. You can play with the weights. You can play with the rankers. You can play with uh, uh, you can tune relevance, whatever you like, how you like. And it's just like this. So it's pretty much just like MySQL with some uh, additions, like uh, you, can, you can supply weight for each field, you can bump up uh, the matches from the, t uh, from the title uh, of the article or, or from the title of the, of the item in, in your store, whatever. But uh, just few more additions to the uh, to the S, to, to the MySQL protocol that uh, makes uh, full text search really convenient. Here's another example of the group by. You can uh, you can see weight in the output. So that's how Sphinx. Uh, that's a result of the. How Runker works. It, do, it does. Uh, it assigns to every result some kind of rank, and you can uh, you can order by rank or order by whatever whatever you want. And well, basically, the next part is will be about um, advanced stuff. So I'm going to take uh, take it over to Andrew. Okay. Oh. I guess this is my huge wake up. Yeah. So, how much time do I have left? I wonder. Forgot my cell phone. I it's a it. oh, All right. I have a network shitload of time. So, uh, all right. Now, that was introductory stuff. Let's uh, go on to the more advanced stuff. Uh, you can really see it on the slide, so I guess I'll just hide behind the laptop, uh, as I usually do. So the, advanced, uh, the more advanced short stuff, um, this falls into several different categories, right? Because there are a few more advanced search tricks related to the full text version. There are at the same time a few tricks related to the non-full text, well, not really sourcing, but rather filtering, grouping, and sorting. Well, basically it's sourcing too, but it's sourcing based on the aggregates of the document rather than uh, the keywords in that document, face edit source, geo source, and a bunch of other, well, tax source specific stuff that we want to cover here. All right. So let's begin with the full tax machine of And the short story is there are a lot of those guys. Normally, uh, the two operators, the two advanced operators that he would normally care about, by the way, uh, are the quorum operator and uh, I'd say the door field uh, limit operator. So, uh, well, obviously everyone uses the phrase which everyone's uh, well, uh, familiar with it and so on. Uh, but why are the quorums and the door fields uh, things important? Well, the door field uh, limits are important because, well, our syntax is all important. So you, you, you got to know that operator to, uh, well, um, uh, customize your, uh, to, to customize your sources, limit them to individual titles or document contents or whatnot. Quora is even more interesting. The typical mistake, actually, uh, that should be on one of the further slides, but uh, one of the most typical mistakes when implementing your search over whatever collection you might have, over your website pages or your legal documents, whatever. Anyway, the typical mistake is to search for all the keywords uh, and require that all the keywords are present in the document, right? And then come up with zero results. Even though, say, uh, there are documents with five out of seven users' keywords in the collection, but you wouldn't match them. 
because no document could match all the seven keywords. And uh, this is where the quorum operator comes into play, because it lets you specify uh, the number of keywords that need to be matched. And uh, it can, uh, that can be specified either with uh, a count or a percentage of the keywords in the query. So in this example, uh, we are matching three keywords out of the world is a wonderful place example, but we could have uh, used the syntax like uh, slash 0.3, meaning that we want to match 30% of uh, the uh, keywords inside the quiz. So we had a question. Uh, just to clarify, the fact that there's double quotes there does not mean that it's a phrase search. It's not searching for those words in like all of the Yes, it is not matching those in order. We have a, uh, a couple operators like that. So the phrase source is uh, basically all the keywords in the quotes, uh, and the proximity source is all the keywords in the code, and then the tilde. Sorry, I don't know how to say it. I know how to spell it, though. So the proximity, uh, the proximity source also does not impose the limit. And uh, the quorum also, it won't uh, impose the individual ordering or anything. So it's going to match the documents. In this particular example, we're going to match the documents where there are three keywords from that set anywhere in the document, just like that. Uh, and this is still not good enough, actually. Uh, because uh, uh, in this particular example, whether we are matching either three keywords or 30% of the keywords, we could still end up make, based on the head count, if you will, based on the mere, uh, mere keyword count, we could still end up matching documents with V and E's and A. And this isn't exactly what we are looking for. So eventually, we'll, uh, we are going to implement a, a yet another syntax which would let you uh, impose uh, ID of quorum f uh, over the uh, keyword uh, over the keywords that participate in the query. Basically, to throw away the keywords that do not match anything, and then try to match only the most rare keywords as opposed to matching the most frequent ones. Uh, now, so these are the two particular operators of interest. So the other ones are more, you know, esoteric, if you will, more rare, but these two are pretty frequent. I mean, field limits, everyone knows field limits. And uh, quorum, it is really useful, but uh, I'd say it kind of an underdog. Now, uh, suddenly, let's jump to the known text filter. Well, we have that. Because uh, in addition to the full text index, we also store document attributes. Those are in memory, specifically for quick access. And there are many different types of attributes. We'll cover it a little bit later. Uh, so filtering is what in SQL terms maps to where conditions, essentially. And you actually might use more complicated uh, conditions than that. In API pool terms, it maps to a bunch of uh, the filter pools. But still, filters versus where conditions versus searching based on attributes is pretty much the same thing. Questions? Any questions? Ask me anything you want. Like, how do you spell your name in Italian? So, Well, yeah, uh, it would. I mean, if you, uh, so the question was about the quorum operator, the record, the question was about the quorum operator versus too frequent or too short words, right? So uh, you can indeed filter them out entirely using stop words or something else, some other mechanisms uh, that will throw away the keywords entirely. So if you punch in V and E's and A into your stop words file, then uh, those keywords are completely wiped out. They will be basically wiped out when indexing and when searching, meaning that the query the world is a wonderful place will actually have three keywords, world, wonderful, and place. The only uh, side effect of those stop words will be that they will still affect the inquiry positions of uh, the remaining three keywords, world and wonderful and place. But uh, other than that, they will be completely gone. Meaning in turn, that in this particular case, the quorum of three will be identical to matching all the keywords. And that's why, well, having a quorum of 0 0.3 or 0 0.4 or 0 0.5 of uh, a few percent is, well, a better thing to have than a fixed-size quorum. And, uh, well, 
sort of, uh, and it would be even better to have um, uh, the idea of waste water. So documents with, uh, even with a single but super rare word would still match and still be ranked very high, while documents with uh, a lot of uh, very common keywords would not be matched because they are combined, well, rareness, if you will, would be just too low. I kind of hope that answers the questions, the, your question and approximately five more questions that you didn't actually even ask. So back to the wear conditions. So we have the wear conditions and group by and order by and whatnot. Uh, so in addition, meaning that in addition to a bunch of full text operators, a bunch of things that work on keywords, you can also add a bunch of things that works, uh, uh, a bunch of things that work on uh, attributes in your query, not text attributes. Uh, so yeah, all that stuff is unlike on the slide before, just before, all this stuff is not just for integer values. You would just as well use integer or uh, floating point or string values or so-called MVAs, which are in a sense a legacy, but a useful one. They are really useful for uh, implementing uh, tag IDs. Uh, and last but not least, we have also feature JSON support. So you could actually index a JSON document, store it on Sphinx and as an attribute, and then access, well, pretty much any, anything within that document when doing matching or sourcing or grouping in your Sphinx query. And, well, all of this stuff on the slide is basically legit syntax. So you could uh, uh, select all, uh, would actually return you uh, a bunch of zeros and ones. All evaluates to zero when uh, there is an element not matching the condition within the array that you are scanning, right? In plainer English, if there is an x value, if there is a value of zero in j column int array subfield, then all is going to return zero. Because all right, not all of the not all of the values in the in the array within the JSON column match the condition. So that's kind of useful. Do you need to use the SQL-like uh, language uh, in order to do JSON searching, or is that available? Uh, do you need to use the uh, SQL? Uh, I think not. For most of the part, we don't. Because, uh, well, the API is a bit of a legacy, right? I mean, if I came up with the idea to implement Sphinx SQL in the first place, I wouldn't uh, ever expose the API at all. But at the same time, there are calls in the API, most importantly, the set select call, which basically send the select list, aka everything that, more, that, in, that in SQL would be written between the select and the from, uh, through the API just as well. So if you do that set select, set select call, then you, you then you can use any kind of a syntax which is also available in Sphinx scale. So that's not a requirement. I think the only real requirement right now, uh, that's, well, I digress, but the only real requirement is that you can't insert data into real-time indexes uh, through the API. That's intentional. We could have implemented that, but we sort of want uh, to force people to switch. Uh, so, what's next? Uh, yet another sudden jump. Uh, how do you, uh, and probably the uh, most interesting topic, or not, uh, how to uh, uh, m improve the quality of your search. And it, it actually takes much more than simply searching for keywords. So you can get up and running with uh, Sphinx or any other text search system in no time. You can match your documents on keywords, and that's it. But uh, Typically, that, that's not enough. Like I said, Google spoiled everyone, and uh, there is much more stuff that needs to be done uh, to implement uh, to implement better research on your website. There's query tuning, rewriting, typo corrections. In some cases, you might want to display related documents. In some cases, and that's an interesting thing. Uh, sometimes, uh, all that additional stuff uh, will be actually more uh, resource intensive than the original search. Uh, I think fun uh, a certain fun example here would be a video that's a local Russian site, basically home of Craigslist, almost as popular too. So they are clocking like 80 to 100 million search queries a day. Uh, in their case, the primary source is very 
well, lightweight, if you will, I mean, uh, maybe five or 10% of their entire storage cluster load cl uh, comes from the actual product sources. And the rest of it is all the auxiliary stuff. Uh, the storage suggestions, most importantly, the related documents, and a few other things that they also use things for. So curiously enough, to implement a good enough storage experience for your end user, you might end up doing a lot more work than just the uh, regular sources, uh, and uh, a lot more work like this. So we definitely do not have the time to cover everything in great detail, but at the same time, we can jump across the title. So let's do that. So bullet number one, topic number one, sourcing by geo does aka does things have geo-sourcing? Yes, we do. We have a pretty efficient implementation of, uh, well, geo uh, function. I think it's pretty, well, it's maybe the fastest implementation out there. Uh, it scans approximately five million, it, it can, uh, yeah, it, it, is, it scans approximately five million rows a second or something like that. It uses a kind of complicated algorithm with, uh, within it and uh, has syntax to feed data in, well, any, it, and now has the syntax to feed the data in any format that you have. It can consume kilometers, miles, meters, what have you. So the syntax is like, uh, just like that. Uh, there are a couple more functions for geo support. Geo plugin support, uh, Basically, two functions, which uh, I forgot to put on this slide. But uh, it's the contains function, and it's the pully2d function. P-O-L-Y-2-D. I'm bad with saying things. I'm okay with uh, spelling things up. So Sphinx can compute a distance between two points for you. Sphinx can uh, compute whether or not a given point is within a polygon for you. And uh, I hear that that pretty much covers well, maybe not 100% of the cases, but maybe 80% of the cases, but 80% uh, of the required geo support cases. So that's one of the things. Uh, another different thing, uh, which is also useful, uh, is sourcing within different ranges, price ranges, date ranges, intervals, and so on. Uh, well, then again, of course, we have them. They simply map to wear conditions, with the exception of this interesting thing, uh, the built-in interval function. It's useful when you need to build, say, a facet on the price ranges, or a facet on the, I don't know, on, on the uh, book publication years, something like that. So when you need to group uh, values into individual uh, random ranges, interval comes to the rescue. So if you need to build something like a facet, uh, grouping all the uh, products which are priced from zero to 50 bucks into one group, 50 to 250 in a second group, and so on, interval is your friend. Uh, other than that, well, the regular wear condition is your friend. So all the thing, all the stuff that you expect from regular SQL applies here too. Yet another sudden jump. Query right. So the stuff before was basically functional. It didn't really do uh, have mu much with the, uh, the source quality. It was more about the source requirements. So if you need to search based on the range, you can do that with either the wear condition or intervals. Geo stuff, you can do that with geodist functions or contains functions, uh, stuff like that. The, uh, Quality-related things related to keyword searching are a bit more complicated. Uh, perhaps the easiest and at the same time the most overlooked source trick. Well, I spilled it before, right? So if you so if you simply push the search stream, the search request from your end user to the search engine, and it tries to match all the keywords and it returns zero results, well, rewrite it. There are a couple of tricks that. Might, that just might improve the source experience for your end user severely. Uh, if that query comes with quotes in it and attempts to match some phrases, well, filter out those quotes. Maybe it will match something useful for the user after all. If uh, 
it still doesn't match, well, relax the match all keywords condition. Use a quorum operator or perhaps switch to slash dot one, which means a quorum style, which means match me all the documents which do have at least a single keyword from the search query. So this is probably the easiest thing to implement, and this is probably the biggest improvement in search quality that you may uh, get, it, well, it yields the best bang for buck. Everything else is diminishing returns, you know, more effort and less improvement. Uh, it, though, actually, in some cases that's not true, of course. That's oversimplified, but still. Uh, yet another jump, now to your spelling corrections. Basically, it did you mean. So, users are dumb. I know I am, and uh, lazy. I know I am very lazy, and they tend to, well, punch in a lot of mistakes, and it's better if you are able to correct those guys. Fix the typos, or in uh, situations with multi-language uh, multi, uh, search, is that even a word in English? I have it is. Uh, you might need to fix the keyboard layout. For uh, I don't know if, it, if if that's the case for the rest of the world, but for us Russians, it's a, it's a typical problem when we punch in a query, but we forget to change the keyboard lay layout, and we end up uh, inputting a lot of stuff. Uh, I mean, I think I'm writing in, in Russian, right? But in all reality, I'm actually writing in English, and the end result is just some some garbage, some junk, which is still possible to map to the actual original keywords uh, to remap. And uh, that's actually really useful too. Uh, we had a client uh, uh, where we worked on uh, storage quality. Uh, I mean, we, we helped the client with uh, all the different aspects of uh, their storage quality, and we were surprised to find out that probably, well, maybe not the biggest jump, but definitely the second biggest jump in, uh, well, uh, storage quality metrics, that came from fixing these guys, from fixing the typos and the transliteration issues combined. I'm not sh I can't comment whether or not one of these guys was responsible, whether it was the typos which were, you know, uh, which yielded the uh, bigger returns or the transliteration issues, but these two combined are, well, again, if not the first, then maybe the second most important thing to have if you care about your search quality. And uh, uh, an interesting thing about uh, spelling corrections is that they, well, perhaps frequently, I would say usually, need to be claimed on your database because they are versical and language specific. I hear that Chimera is a very frequent last name in Portuguese, and if you're searching through a database of Portuguese persons, then evidently camera is actually a typo. Then again, if you're on a US-based photo website, then camera is a typo. And then again, jump to a regal site and probably the guy searching for camera actually meant Chevy Camaro. So there. Uh, it's all, well, uh, uh, very local, if you will. It, it needs to be tied to your specific language and your specific vertical. And uh, how can Sphinx help? Well, a little bit. Uh, our built-in capabilities are not great. Uh, they might improve over, over time. But at the same time, there is something you can do. Uh, we have a demo of uh, implementing spelling corrections with Sphinx. The uh, main idea is pretty simple. Sphinx lets you build a frequency dictionary of your data. Uh, the indexer program has a switch for that. That's all explained in the uh, documentation for the uh, spelling corrections demo. And uh, you build a frequency dictionary, you suck it in into the auxiliary database, and then into the auxiliary index. You build a pre-gram index for basically early stage matching on top of that. And uh, you use that index to quickly filter out the most uh, interesting, uh, the most potentially interesting spelling corrections, and then you filter those results additionally using a uh, more sophisticated and complex function like Levenstein business. So that's it. It's semi-manual, if you will. It's not completely automated, but at the same time, uh, quite a few people deployed our demo with, well, little tricking on their websites and, well, implemented the spelling corrections. Hopefully, eventually, we'll have something built in, but really, this is um, uh, 
how do I, well, say, th this is kind of foreign, uh, this is kind of a foreign operation to a full text index. This needs to be a, this is something really, really additional, really auxiliary, which really doesn't belong in the index. I mean, this is additional data needed for suggestions only. We can build that internally, but the problem is that uh, uh, I'm not sure whether or not we can build a data structure internally, which would cater to all needs. Because depending on your particular collection, particular target language, you might need to tweak that stuff. You can tweak the PHP script easily. Right. You can tweak the engine. It's a collection. Way. It's a PHP script that you can extend uh, uh, to line up your to to mesh your data to to do whatever you want. It's uh, it, it's very easy to find. It's very easy to implement. Right. Bottom line, it's a hundred line PHP script. It's much harder. It's much easier for you to tweak than a five hundred line C++ right. implementation within the engine. And on top, and unfortunately. It needs tweaking. The day I found out, uh, the day I find out how to implement it without any tweaking or with all the needed external knobs, I'm uh, integrating that functionality into the engine. And yet another jump: uh, Sphinx versus related sources implementation. The basic idea is pretty simple, and uh, the, it's the same idea as with regular sources. So I want to find the related documents in my database. Well, let's begin with the original query. Let's relax its sourcing constraints. Maybe drop the filters. Uh, definitely uh, uh, relax the matching constraints and uh, replace the match all operator, implicit match all operator, with a quorum operator. And uh, from there, if that doesn't, if that just isn't good enough, you can improve further, improve on these baseline results that match uh, some of the keywords using custom sourcing. For instance, if it's uh, for instance, if uh, the site in question is a product website, if you, you're matching in the same category as the original source, well, let's boost the weight, the record weight a little. If, it, if the price is not the same but in the close range, let's boost the weight again. If it belongs to the same vendor that the user searched for, let's boost the weight, the weight again, and so on and so forth. Again, I to, uh, the Russian Craigslist is a nice example here. They ended up building quite a sophisticated related matches implementation with uh, different formulas for different categories. I mean, when you're searching for related items in autos versus uh, real estate, the factors that you, well, factor in are very different. So they ended up having a bunch of formulas, not too much, maybe 10 to 20 to 30 formulas, with uh, combining all the different signals which uh, are important for that particular uh, for every particular category, and that works neatly in Sphinx because the baseline switch works easily and nicely with the quorum operator, and this custom stuff with custom boosts and so on can be well simply passed by means of an expression in select. We can do math, and we actually can do it like three times faster than my SQL according to my benchmarks. Uh, yet another sudden jump and uh, throughout all the quality-related topics. So snippets, well, Sphinx can build them. There's that, there's both for that, and that all comes with a bunch of options to customize those snippets. And this is not entirely convenient because currently we do not store the original document contents. So you don't need to pull up the original uh, the uh, search results from Sphinx, then mainly get back to your database and pull up the documents from the <coughs> database, a handful of documents from your database, then send them back to Sphinx for snippet highlighting. But, well, that's not great, but at the same time, that's not that bad either because the typical search engine results page would contain like 10 or 20 meshes. So that round trip to the database for the documents and the, the extra round trip to Sphinx and then, is and, and not that trick, You can actually store uh, original documents inside the Sphinx. It, 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 will, it will, might not be that convenient, but it's... Uh, you might, uh, yes, technically, formally you can do that, but that's something right. I would not recommend because it's easy to bump into all the different kinds of limits. So that's because of performance on a highly uh, loaded databases and uh, search engines. All right, basically we're fixing this in 3.0 because one of the things we're working on 3.0 is the internal document storage. When that is implemented, snippets will, uh, Sphinx will be able to generate snippets for you without an extra trip to the database or and or Sphinx because uh, the data will be just, well, there on Sphinx. But right now it, it's a bit awkward. We're fixing, uh, we're fixing that. Now to the most uh, uh, complicated and at the same time surprisingly overrated part. 
And that was indeed surprising to find. It was indeed surprising to find out that uh, uh, during the relevance formula, well, it is important. In some cases, it's the only way you could pull up the relevant results to the top. At the same time, uh, I'm intentionally putting it uh, in the bottom of the list, if you will, because uh, on the smaller collections, the improvements from all the other techniques in the list, quorums, rewriting the query, doing nicer snippets, generating proper related documents, and so on and so forth, surprisingly, they are bigger than improvements uh, from, uh, well, actually changing the relevance formula. However, if your collection is large enough, they have quite a bunch of text signals, I mean text-based signals, I mean uh, ranking signals based on the text of the document and the query. Uh, like the simpler ones would be the matching word count, so the more, a little bit more sophisticated ones would be the sum of, the, of all the IDFs, of all the matching keywords, and perhaps the most crazy one that they have is an ATC factor, health flow to compute. Uh, it decodes this average total closeness, and it basically looks at all the keyword pairs within the document. It considers the IDFs, the rareness of those keywords. It considers the proximity, and it grows higher uh, when uh, the keywords are more rare, and when they are closer, when they are group closer. Uh, so, there is very bunch of text signals based on query and uh, the uh, document. And you can combine them in any way you want. So the uh, stupid default ranker that ages 12 or maybe 13 years now is actually the very first one on the slide. It's the sum of all the LCS signals, longest common subsequence, basically the length uh, of uh, the, 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 longest, the longest common subphrase length between the query and the document, multiplied by a thousand, and then. Uh, Pimped up by the M25 statistical factor. You can easily improve on that by A, tweaking the weights, and B, switching from uh, our hard coded implementation to a BM 25 f function which lets me tweak the weights. You can pimp that up even more by adding even more text signals into the equation. And you can actually plug any document interviews into that equation. And in this, in this, in this po at this point, sky's the limit. Because the document attributes might be very different. It might be the document age, the page rank, the, uh, uh, what you call it, uh, the domain trustworthiness metric, the domain age, and so on and so forth. So, uh, so there. I think the most sophisticated ranking function that I've seen so far combines like 150 different signals. Most of them are document-based rather than text-based, and it takes a approximately forever to evaluate. So basically, in other words, if you're trying to build a web scale search with Sphinx, uh, you will definitely need to store your data in MongoDB, then it's gonna blow, and you will just export the data in text files. But for the search part, you can use Sphinx, and it actually lets you build a sophisticated, a sophisticated enough uh, ranking function to be, well, applicable to the large scale uh, web search. And if you did not get all that uh, relevant stuff, uh, like like just I do, they have oh, support. No they they, they provide in support for uh, that relevance tuning by themselves. It, it, uh, it's, it's okay. It's no okay. Search and uh, Palomino, uh, Blackbird providing support for uh, for MySQL environment. That's what well. they only get remarked in plus. Yes. I mean, our marketing people are going to kill us if we don't do that. Uh, this should be a severe prejudice too. Okay, I actually have just two slides left and they are simpler than this stuff. So, speaking of relevance tuning, two things that you really, really, really need to understand about relevance tuning. First, it's always based on human judgment. There is no automated way to compute relevance. You always, always depend on the rankings that actually leave human beings attached to the pairs of queries and documents. Query, uh, I need a train to Santa Clara from San Francisco. Document, document A, not relevant. Document B, not relevant. Document C, relevant. Document D, extremely relevant. I want this at the first position in my search results. And that's an actual human being, uh, the assessor, doing those uh, judgments, assessments. Uh, and well, you need to do that. If you're serious about your search quality, you will need to do that. 
you will also need to automate early because uh, starting as early as seven to 10 queries, you can't really do anything if you don't automate it. But at the same time, it's not as bad as it sounds because actually you can get a few thousand of those relevance judgments in a day. We have worked with uh, several clients on that. The usual agreement is that we can get like 10 to 20,000 judgments done in a week with a team of like a, a few people, a handful of people. I mean, three, five, that kind of stuff. After you've done with that, after you, after you have a bunch of uh, relevance judgments, you compute a number of meaningless uh, information with little metrics on top of them, uh, and you start obsessing uh, about your relevance formula. You start tweaking the coefficients, you start plugging in the additional relevance factors, then all of a sudden you finally fix that issue with typos, and you see your metrics jump. And I realized that what, uh, what we were seeing on the private search website. Uh, and that's almost it, and this was supposed to be the conclusion, but instead of it, we haven't even mentioned a bunch of other interesting stuff that Sphinx can do, like soft real-time indexes with pretty much guarantees on the insertion time, advanced text processing stuff. We haven't even touched uh, the morphology things, the blended characters stuff, which the social data mining industry seems to love, geo-searching facets, some little usual things that you would expect for um, the text search engine, uh, some cluster ar architectures and HA advice. Uh, all of that stuff is there, out there. We don't have any time to cover it. Uh, we'll have to do it to, to the convention center. But the takeout is, well, you might want to go and find things. It's a, it might be useful. And that's it. And we're out of time.